Welcome. Welcome to another one of my educational videos. This video I want to talk about interpreting lab results. And when we are interpreting lab results, the devil is in the detail. So where is the devil? Let me show you. The devil here is in Portico de la Gloria in Santiago de Compostela, built from 1168 to 1188. And you can see two devils there. One of them is piercing the tongue of a sinner. The other one seems to be holding a rope on his neck. The devil can be seen in many different interpretations in medieval art. In this example, in saint foy de conque in France, that was built in between 1050 and 1130, you can also see the devil depicted there. This uh, saint foy de conque is actually between Lyon and Toulouse on the way to Santiago de Compostela, which is a very well-known pilgrimage that in medieval times, people were doing from all places in Europe to reach the no northwest of Spain, where the body of St. James was buried. And during this pilgrimage, there's a lot of different stops that have churches, cathedral. This was a very religious route that people did. And during the time that they were going, they Many of them did not know how to read, so they were reading these pieces of architecture. And it is really hard to see the devil, but it's there because the devil is a very important figure in biblical stories. The devil can also be found in sculpture. This is an example from the 19th century. In Rennes les Chateaux, the Church of St. Mary Magdalene was probably built around the 9th century, although they think it may be earlier. But it was the priest Saunier who actually rebuilt this church in around 1896, and he commissioned all of these sculptures. This particular devil in the form of an Asmodeus is found at the bottom of, or the foot, let's say, of the pillar that's holding the holy water is a font of holy water. And you would have a hard time finding it unless you read the Da Vinci Code and you actually want to look for it. The devil can also be found, of course, in paintings. And now we're moving to medieval times. Uh, these stories were continually being told. And of course, this is a famous last judgment of Michelangelo Buonarroti that it's in the Sistine Chapel. This was painted between 1536 and 1541. Another ways of depicting the devil that you can find are these two examples on the same painting that seem to be very surrealistic. And actually, you can see one of them has like an insect face and it's punishing somebody who was playing backgammon. You wouldn't be blamed to believing that this is a Salvador Dali surrealistic painting from the 20th century, but you would be wrong. It's uh, painted by Jeronimus Bosch. This is in the Prado Museum in Madrid, and it's from the Jardín de las Delicias, which is a triptych. So where is the devil? Well, as I had mentioned in the Portico de la Gloria, this is at the bottom of the foot of a statue. In, some, in, in, in the case of the Sonier Asmodeus, it's also at the foot of the pillar. You usually have to look down. So where is the devil? In the other examples I gave you in saint foy de conque you can see that it's actually uh, the below where the images of you know, Christ, angels, prophets, and usually people are. So the devils usually you have to look down in the bottom part of the architecture, the sculpture, or the painting. This is the same for Hieronymus Bosch, the Jardín de las Delicias, the two devilish figures that I highlighted before are way in the bottom. And in Michelangelo's la Last Judgment, it really is at the very bottom of the Last Judgment. And you, by the way, they say that uh, Michelangelo painted the face of Bramante in that particular devil. It is apocryphal, but it's a funny story. Apparently, they had a row and Michelangelo uh, exerted his revenge by painting Bramante as a devil. But in any case, the devil is actually found, you have to look down. 
that's where the devil is usually found. Why am I talking about this? This talk was supposed to be about interpreting test results, especially when they come back positive. What do they mean? Well, I showed you where the devil is. And when interpreting test results, the devil is in the denominator. Look down and you will find it. So uh, I'm taping this in June 2020. Uh, in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, there's no vaccine available and there's no treatment available yet. So I know that I'm talking in the future. You will be seeing this in the future and maybe this is already irrelevant for COVID. But this example is good for any kind of test. So bear with me on the explanation of how can we tell what does it mean if somebody comes back positive? Let me walk you through these examples. And the first thing I'm going to do is explain the table. We have three rows and three columns. On the first row, we're going to see how many are testing positive. Below that, how many are testing negative, And then the total people. The next uh, column will show the people who really have the condition that the test is made for. The next column is those who don't have it and then the totals. And looking at that, let's populate this table. So in the first example using the COVID-19 antibody testings, we have 4,309,000 people in Boston. So let's assume 4 million people. That number goes at the bottom right of the table. The Boston population as of June 4th that have been detected to have COVID antibodies, so they have a positive test, is 12,906 people. They have been confirmed to have the antibody. So for the ease of calculations, let's use 10,000. So that goes in the column that says people who have antibodies. So now let's look at the test. If we have a test that has 100% sensitivity, it means that 100% of the people who have antibodies will also be testing positive. This is a very good test and I am using 100 because of the antibody tests that have been made available to the public as of today. There's at least two or three of them that have a 100% sensitivity. So what do we do in a table? Well, all the 10,000 people in Boston with antibodies will be testing positive and none of them will have a negative test. So far, so good. So you might think, well, where is the problem of interpreting a positive result? There are 3,990,000 people who do not have antibodies. So what happens when we test them? Let's assume a 95% specificity of the antibody. The specificity of, an, of, of a test means that if you have 100% specificity, it means that 100% of the people who do not have the condition will be testing negative. So sensitivity is 100% of the people with the condition will come back positive and 100% specificity is that people who don't have the condition will test negative. With me so far? All right, why am I using 95%? This is a very good specificity for a test. I'm using 95 because I was just reviewing yesterday the literature on what's available. There's, there's more and more laboratories being validated for these diagnoses and the reports uh, that have been done actually by independent reviewers include anywhere from 70% specificity all the way to about 99%, which is the latest claimed specificity of, an, of a test. And of course, one of the problems is you would be thinking, well, why don't people just develop tests that have 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. Well, in some of the platforms that are used for the test or the way that we test conditions, 
it's a linear curve of going higher and higher. And when you have conditions like that, that is not very clear yes or no, uh, you have to measure and say, where is my cut point? Where is the cut point of the reading that I'm going to call positive? So if you normally want to make sure that all the positives are truly testing positive, you may need to give up on having some people who are negative also testing positive in the scale because you want to go as low as possible to say from this point it is a positive test. And that's one of the things that when developing these tests, they usually have to also provide the scale and the validation. So the 90% specificity means that 90% of the people who don't have antibodies in this case will actually be testing negative. And that means that we have 3,790,500 people that test negative, which leaves us with almost 200,000 people that are going to be testing positive, but they do not have antibodies. So we have a total of 209,500 209, positive tests, of which the majority are not really true positives. So what does it mean when you come back with a positive test? Well, among all of the positives are people who truly are positive, but there's a lot of them who are not. So this leaves us to say, why are we doing this testing? We do need to understand what is the value of having these tests. Evidently, there's no question about it with a test that has 100% sensitivity, a negative test is certain. You don't have it. Um, but what happens with a positive test? Well, the positive predictive value of a test is what you need to take care of and look at. This is identifying what is the probability or the predictive value that if I have a positive test, I truly have the condition. And in this case, the example with COVID, it would be 4.7% chances that you do have the antibodies. And this is just using the whole population of the, this particular date and time in Boston. So that's what I'm saying. When you need to know how to interpret a positive result, you need to be careful about sensitivity and specificity, but most importantly, what is the positive predictive value? Now, the thing is, the denominator here that I'm using is 10,000 divided by 210,000 people because I'm using a total population of 4 million people in Boston. But the reality is that we don't really know that all 4 million people uh, have or don't have antibodies. We know that 10,000 have been found with antibodies, but of how many? And that's what really will drive the positive predictive value. Let me show you example two to explain what I mean. In this example, we're going to use the same population that we know, but in this case, we are going to use only the population in Boston that have been tested as of June 4th. So those 10,000 positives came out of 47,043 people tested. So let's use 50,000 instead of 4 million for the calculation. So of the 50,000 people tested, we know that 10,000 had the antibodies. And because it's the same test, sensitivity is 100%, then all 10,000 will come back positive and none of them will come back negative. So that leaves us 40,000 people who don't have antibodies. Remember, they have been tested. They don't have antibodies and with a 95% specificity, this means that 38,000 of them 
tested negative. So this is looking better. At least we know that there's only 2,000 people who do not have the antibodies that tested positive for a total of 12,000 positive tests. So 2,000 of them were told they were positive and they did not have it. So in this case, the positive predictive value will actually be higher. It's 83%. And of course, the more and more testing we do, the more we can confirm what is the positive predictive value. But without knowing what is the denominator that we need to use, because I'm just using what I know has been reported in Boston. But if you are tested, I don't know what your particular test has done. They, they will tell you sensitivity and specificity, but they will not tell you the positive predictive value or the negative predictive value. And this is one of the reasons why oftentimes, if it is positive, people say, let's check it again. Let's do another testing. And that's why I say the devil for interpreting, the devil is in the denominator. So look down, like when you look at those medieval churches, find the devil. It's usually in the bottom part. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you like, check other videos in my YouTube channel. Thank you very much.